us. Uh, it's hard to know what the audience is going to be like in a presentation like this, and I have been told never overestimate the experience level of an audience, so I'm going to assume at least some of you are absolute beginners with respect to open ACC and highly parallel programming. So in this session, what we're going to see is a brief introduction to OpenACC. I actually am going to run a very short live demo uh, near the beginning here. Uh, so OpenACC, what it is, how it works, why it's important, um, overview of some of the applications that have been parallelized for acceleration with OpenACC. We'll cover portability from GPU accelerated Xeons and Power 8 and Power 9 plus Tesla, Tesla platforms a little bit about performance portability and ease of building and running programs. So during this presentation, I'm wearing two hats. I am the technical chair, I'm sorry, I'm the chair of the technical committee of the OpenACC uh, group. So I'm wearing my OpenACC hat. And I'm also a lead developer of the GPU compilers at PGI, the PGI compilers for NVIDIA. So I'll be wearing my PGI hat as well. And I'll try to tell you which hat I'm wearing in different parts of the presentation. Um, and so a, uh, an obligatory marketing slide. There will be a couple of these, but not many. PGI, now I'm wearing my PGI hat. You can think of PGI as NVIDIA's HPC software development kit. Fortran C and C++ compilers optimized for parallel and numerical intensive computing, support for SIMD vectorization and OpenMP for multi-core CPUs, MPI interoperability for scalable systems, OpenACC for GPU acceleration, also for multi-core systems, on 64-bit x86 and open power CPUs, Linux, Windows, and it runs on Mac OS, we have our own tools for profiling and debugging. We also work closely with ARM, uh, with Alinea at ARM, and with TotalView at Rogue Wave for DDT and TotalView. Now, a couple of these slides are in a slightly, if you're looking at the PDF file, a couple of these slides are in a slightly different order. So when we're looking at how to build a faster computer. There's really only three things that you can do if you're a computer designer. One is make the clock go faster. Well, we're pretty much done here. Uh, if you looked at the speeds of processors from the early mid-1990s to the early mid-2000s, we went from 30 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, a factor of 100 in about 10 years in clock speed improvement. And it stopped right there. It's not that they can't make them go faster, but it gets uh, takes up more real estate and a lot more power and heat. These chips start to become unreliable because they're so hot. Now, there are some specialized signal processors that will run up to 10 gigahertz. IBM at one point had a 5 gigahertz power processor, but we're not going to see speeds like that anytime in the near future. So that is pretty much done. So we're stuck with the last two. More work per clock. That means parallelism. So this can be done explicitly with instructions that are parallel, like SIMD instructions at the control unit level. It's multiple instructions per clock, instruction level parallelism. Chip level parallelism, that means multiple cores on a chip or socket level, multiple CPUs or maybe a CPU and an accelerator. And then node level parallelism, so many, many nodes. Most of the parallelism that we see on these high-performance supercomputers has been and will remain at the node level, hundreds and thousands of nodes. We've seen tens of thousands of nodes, 90,000 nodes in the case of some of the large blue gene Q systems. But the recent growth in parallelism, and I mean recent as in for the last 10 years, the growth in parallelism has mostly been within a node. SIMD operations, wider SIMD operations, more instruction level parallelism, by that I mean instructions per clock, more cores on a chip, more sockets on a node. A lot more parallelism in the node. That's exactly the problem OpenACC is intended to address, is the node level parallel, parallelism within a node. And the third thing to make faster computers is don't stall. Mostly this has to do with memory and branch latencies. So things like 
Cache memory hierarchy, well, that's there so the processor won't stall waiting on memory. Branch prediction, so the processor, the core, won't stall waiting for a branch condition to resolve. Register forwarding, so you're not stalled waiting on registers to be, uh, values to be stored and loaded out of registers. They all fall into this category. Those are all intended to reduce stalls for a single thread running on a core. There's another category of solution that's to keep the processing unit busy even when the thread does stall. That's multi-threading. So Intel's processors have what they call hyper-threading. They keep the state of two threads on the core. When one thread stalls, they can switch to the other thread in a single cycle, very fast. The Xeon Phi, they have four threads per core. So because they expect more stalls, they have the capability now to switch between more threads. GPUs in particular use multi-threading very heavily because GPUs are designed as throughput engines, not latency engines. They're not optimized for single thread performance. They don't have deep cache hierarchies. They don't have branch prediction. They don't use out of order execution or um, uh, register forwarding or of some of these features that are used in a CPU that take up a lot of transistor real estate. Instead, they store the state of many threads, dozens of workload threads on a core, and we're dropping off rapidly here. And so they use highly parallel um, uh, multi-threading within the core to keep the processing unit busy. And how do you fill those multi-thread slots? More parallelism. So that's, you need high level of parallelism now within your node to keep everything busy and performing well. And this is our second marketing slide. So the PGI Community Edition is now available for free. It can be downloaded from the website. You can install it on your workstation, x86 or Power Linux or Windows or Mac OS. It includes all the features all the tools, everything is enabled. The binary is generated or not licensed or restricted in any way. The only thing that's limited is there are fewer updates and support is limited to user forms. Uh, and the license is annual, so you, you'll want to update a new, uh, download a new version at least once a year. And then there are the other professional and uh, enterprise edition compilers. Okay, very brief introduction to OpenACC. So there are, uh, this is pragma-based or directive-based programming. You'll see very many similarities to OpenMP. So there are uh, three types of, essentially three types of directives, and I'm going to start in the middle. The ACC parallel is to initiate or start parallel execution. There's also a kernels directive that will start parallel execution of the loops or the code contained within. Um, and so, and you can relate this to OMP parallel. The significant difference is with ACC parallel and the loop, this is guaranteed by the directive that it is a truly parallel loop. It's not spreading the execution of the loop. It's not defined as spreading the, the uh, iterations of the loop across the parallel thread. It's defined as this is a parallel loop. Execute this in parallel as fast as you can. At the outer level, there's data management. That is specific to GPUs, where you have a separate system memory and device memory. Now, there's been a lot of work, and the PGI compiler does a lot of work to do implicit data management where it can. The, the penalty for making bad decisions is so high that OpenACC also allows the user to take to control of this. So to uh, insert directives to control when data gets moved, from the system memory to the device memory and back, and in what direction. So in this case, uh, the directive says copy A and B from the system memory into the device and copy the result out. So it's optimizing the data movement to, between the two. And this is going to be a, a moment when I'm going to do my live example. So here I've got, I'm going to do the C++ version, the, the Fortran 90 version is basically the same. And so I have this program. It's a Jacobi iterative solver of a, uh, of a linear equation, AX equals B. And what it's doing is doing a, uh, the, the matrix happens to be uh, diagonally dominant, positive definite. 
So it's very easy to prove that the iterative solver will converge. So what it's doing here is a essentially a uh, matrix vector product and computing a new result. And then uh, later on, we'll compute the residual, which is the difference, the sum of the squares, the differences between the new, val new result and the old result, and we'll continue until the residual uh, reaches a small enough value. And here I'm swapping the new and the old val uh, vector pointers. And here are the directives. So this is a parallel loop directive saying I is, in fact, a parallel loop. J is also a nested parallel loop and has a reduction contained in it. Here I put in a data clause for the array A. Now, notice I did not put in data clauses for X old and X new and B, and you'll see why momentarily. The reason that we had to put the data clause in for A is the compiler is not clever enough to figure out from the reference pattern for A how much of A actually needs to be put onto the device. Now I have my data clause at the outer level saying I want to move all the data only once at the outermost level. A and B are input only, so I only need to copy them in one direction. X1 and X2, those are the, the, the two vectors. Those will be copied in both directions. And my convergence test is another parallel loop, again, with the reduction, the sum reduction. And I'm going to make this three times. So I'm going to build this once. This is using now the PGI 17.7 compilers. I'm compiling it with the dash fast option, and I'm running it with a thousand by thousand matrix here with a maximum of 5,000 iterations. And here we actually get, it converges in 4,448 iterations, takes 5.5 seconds. So here I did not enable OpenACC. I only put the dash fast option. So this is running on a single core. You can see it pretty much used the whole core. In this case, I'm running on my desktop system, which is a six core Haswell. Now, so here I'm building it with the TA equals multi-core. It's saying enabling OpenACC and saying my target accelerator is the host multi-core. Enabling the mInfo option for the accelerator option. So I see here I'm generating multi-core code, I'm generating a reduction. Here's the, the first loop generating multi-core code. Here's the second loop and the reduction. And now what you see is it runs a heck of a lot faster and only takes one second. It uses, well, it looks like it uses five CPUs out of six. So it's getting a speed up of about five. And now I'm going to rebuild this using T equals Tesla. So now it's building for the GPU. It happens to be a Kepler GPU. It's running the same program and it runs a little bit faster. I could run this on a 2000 by 2000 matrix and you see the, the performance difference between the CPU side and the GPU side is a little bit more dramatic but I don't have a heck of a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, skip that uh, short example. If we, have, if we need to at the end, we can certainly run that. Back to my slide. So here is uh, an example. This happens to be a Fortran snippet. The way OpenACC works is you're executing the Fortran program on the host and it reaches a kernels or parallel construct. And now the compiler will say, oh, I need to get A over on the device. And here I haven't put any data clauses, but the reference pattern is simple enough that the compiler can determine that I need to put A from 1 to N over on the device. So we'll allocate memory and copy the data over. It gets to the kernel. It launches the kernel on the device to compute the exponential, gets to the end, and copies the results back, and then deallocates the data and continues on. Now, that's simple enough, but uh, the connection between the two here is a relatively slow PCI Express bus if you're on an x86 system. On the power system, that's going to be with Pascal and Volta GPUs, that will be an NVLink, which is several times faster, but still not as fast as memory. So what we have now is the option to optimize. This is the, the data clauses, optimize the data traffic. And so this is very similar to the example I showed before where I have an iterative loop, and I have an iterative solver, and then the parallel execution within, and the data clause is outside. And so what I'm doing here is get to the data construct, allocate the memory. The B data gets copied over, but A does not, because A is only uh, live on the device. Get to the compute region, do my computation, do the copy back. Then run around the iterative solver, do my computation, copy it back, and continue on until I get to the last iteration, copy it back, and at the end, 
copy B back and deallocate the data. And so uh, in C, as we saw before, it more or less works exactly the same way. Um, all of these features are obviously supported. And you can compile it and target for a multi-core. You can compile it and target for a GPU. And in fact, you can generate a single binary that compiles and targets for either one and dynamically select either under program control or implicitly. And uh, today, the compilers will, if you don't say otherwise, will always defer to use a GPU if you have one. And if you don't, we'll use the multi-core at runtime. And how well does this work? Now, for those of you that are new, this is using the PGI 17.7, which was released um, not too very long ago. So there is a, a spec benchmark suite, spec Excel. There's a subset of those, 15 of those use open ACC benchmarks. So we took the spec Excel 1.2 benchmarks, which was, uh, was a refresh of the spec Excel benchmarks just a couple of months ago. These runs were done in August using the PGI 17.7 compilers. And I'm showing speed up versus a single Haswell core. So these are the spec, this is the geometric mean of the 15 benchmarks. And so on the dual core Haswell, it's running about 10 times faster. It's a dual socket, 16 cores each socket Haswell, about 10 times faster than a single Haswell core. Broadwell is about 25% faster than that. Uh, dual socket power eight is about the same performance as a Broadwell. This is running all those parallelism, all the parallelism across the multi-core. All the data clauses get essentially ignored because the data is always present in the system memory already. They don't need to do any data allocation or movement whatsoever. Now we take exactly the same code, recompile it to run, in this case, uh, on an, a, um, uh, uh, P8 plus Power 100, and now it's 49 times faster, almost 50 times faster than a uh, single core Haswell. And this number has changed since I sent the PDF file out um, for those of you that are interested. Let me do one more uh, short performance example. So the Cloverleaf code, this was developed at the Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK. This is one of their mini apps that um, emulates the performance of some of their real applications. The hydrodynamics code, about 6,000 lines. They've parallelized this with many different parallelism strategies, OpenMP, MPI, OpenACC, CUDA, and others. And you can get the source code. You can run this yourself of the many different versions. And their source code looks a lot like this. They uh, like to use the kernels directive. So for those of you that are not familiar, um, the AC, open ACC has a parallel clause and a kernels clause. And the parallel clause is much more like OpenMP, where it creates parallelism and then you spread the iterations of the parallel loops across the parallelism that you've created. The kernels clause gives a little bit more freedom to the compiler. And so the compiler takes more control of the mapping. There's two parts here, identifying the parallelism and then mapping the parallelism onto the device which loop will run in SIMD mode, which loop is going to be run across the cores, which loop is going to be run across the threads within a core, for instance. And so if you have nested parallel loops like this, no procedure calls and so on, then the kernel's directive can be quite successful, particularly actually if you're a Fortran programmer, because as we all know, Fortran is a higher level language. So here the user has identified the parallelism with the independent clauses. It's identified the private variables. And the compiler will take the inner loop because that's the stride one loop and map that in a SIMD dimension on a multi-core or on a, uh, on a GPU would map that across the threads within a thread block, for instance. And um, this is all those 6,000 lines or 6,000 odd lines of loops inside the Cloverleaf app look pretty much all like this. And they compile that with dash fast, T equals Tesla when compiling for the GPU, and T equals multicore when compiling for the multicore, the exact same code. Um, and there's the, the same M info options. If you're using the PGI compiler, we encourage you to use the M info output because the compiler is telling you what it's doing. And 
If, it, if it's not what you think it should be doing, then you have the option to uh, modify that. And performance that we see on that code. So here we're comparing now PGI OpenACC with the OpenACC version of the code against the Intel OpenMP compiler with the OpenMP version of that code. What we're seeing is we get effectively the exact same performance that the Intel compiler gets out of that code on the Haswell and the Broadwell. The Power 8, we're using the Excel, the IBM's Excel compilers. And so we're almost at exactly the same performance as the IBM Excel compiler. We're still tuning the CPU code here. Uh, then we ran this with a Kepler and a Pascal. You see it's faster on a Kepler than any of the CPUs and three times faster again on a Pascal. And the last two lines, so um, they've parallelized this again with MPI as well as OpenACC and OpenMP. And so if we run this on a single node with MPI and have each MPI rank take a different GPU, we can see another factor of improvement of performance. So we've been showing benchmarks like this for the past few years. But what's new now is adoption in uh, real applications in the, the community applications and by independent software vendors. So some of you may be familiar, for instance, with Gaussian. It's one of the largest chemistry codes, has been for many, many years. Mike Frisch has been developing this for decades, probably as long as I've been working on compilers. So what they wanted was a way to move the computationally intensive parts of their code onto a GPU where you can do computation, intensive computation more quickly without having to refactor the entire program. And OpenACC fit that bill. And they get to use the same code for multi-core as well. And other examples, ANSYS took their Fluent code. So this is a similar, so what happened was one of their developers took some OpenACC training, started experimenting on one of their solvers, and we're seeing some really great speed ups on their radiation transport. We helped them a little bit. We at PGI helped them a little bit with their window support, but essentially all of the porting work was done by ANSYS developers with no more than a couple hours of uh, phone call converse conversations every couple of weeks. So now they're ramping up to a larger team of developers and they're speeding up a wider range of their solvers and um, they're going to see some great performance when they start moving those to uh, Pascal and Volta. Uh, so Numeca fine slash open is not as well known, but it's an example having uh, great success with OpenACC and C++. David Gutzweller had a great talk at GTC earlier this past May. If you can go back and watch that on the uh, GPU Tech Conference website. It shows what you can do in a C++ code to take advantage of the high-level features of C++ but still have, when it still has computation, it's concentrated in loops. So C++, I'm sorry, OpenACC is really not ideal for codes that do all their compute intensive work on the STL templated data types, um, but you can still get a lot of good performance out of C++. MPAS is a new numerical weather model being developed at NCAR and the DOE. At this point, they're seeing speed ups about a factor of three with a single P100 over dual socket Xeon. Um, these were, in this case, Broadwell's 18 cores per socket. So they're, uh, they're trying to get their code into shape to get a fair comparison of GPU versus uh, CPU performance. FV3 is another weather model. It's not as far along, um, but it's being developed at NOAA. And some of the, so they don't have the whole application performance, but they're seeing uh, performance on uh, uh, some of their kernels that we're showing here. And a couple of quick more examples here. Quantum Espresso, I won't spend much time on. It's really a CUDA Fortran code, but they're using this Cuff Kernels Directive, which is basically like the OpenACC Kernels Directive as well. Uh, Cosmo is an atmospheric model being developed in Europe at the DWD in Germany and Matteo Swiss in Switzerland. It was one of the first major success stories of a production application using OpenACC. And they're still trying to wring more performance out of that. It's using both the Cray and the PGI compilers. And much more recently, VAST. So this is an ab initio chemistry code. They've just been working on this the last few months. They had been using CUDA C, but the problem is their main code base was Fortran and they didn't want to have to keep two code bases current as they 
modernize and change the algorithms in their code. So they backported their CUDA C to OpenACC and Fortran, and now they're seeing even better performance, not because the OpenACC compiler is better than CUDA compiler. I mean, it's a good compiler. I'm very proud of it. But because they can now port more pieces of their program much more productively to the GPU, and so they're getting better performance now than they were before. And there's a workshop coming up next month where they're gathering everybody in Vienna to kick off an effort to GPU accelerate even more of their code. So a couple more tidbits here, PGI for Open Power and Tesla. So all the apps work I was covering was done mostly on x86, but all that functionality is also available on Open Power at the machine that's following uh, Titan there, the Summit machine, will be using the PGI compilers on the Open Power and the Volta GPUs there. So the PGI compilers for Power were introduced late last year, and they're almost performance, I'm sorry, almost functional parity with the PGI compilers for Linux. In the most cases, you can actually recompile to run between the two systems, and you're going to, uh, same command line options, uh, for the most part, all the the, the program doesn't need to change very much. There are a few things that do need to change, uh, which I'll get into very, very briefly in the very next slide. But here's a case where we took the gyrokinetic toroidal code in all the source code is in one directory and they have two build directories and we had the exact same make files to compile the GTC for x86 plus uh, Tesla and power plus Tesla. And what we're seeing here is uh, running four MPI processes on um, uh, different uh, configurations of systems. Um, in this case, uh, it was speed up over, I believe, a single Haswell core again. Let me move along here. So these are some of the differences. If you're porting from x86, 64-bit x86 to power, there are differences in the platforms. Um, uh, you really want to avoid inline ASM and the SSE or AVX intrinsics. Those are a really bad idea anyway, so you shouldn't have been using those. Um, you might see some differences in precision um, across different targets, but uh, We've gotten a little bit lazy about expecting the same, exactly the same precision when we rerun or port to a different target. We're going to have to relearn that as we move forward. But that's a separate topic. So let me talk a little bit about Volta. So Volta's coming up. Uh, we're just starting. I mean, we, we're part of NVIDIA. We're just starting to see Volta chips where, that we can do real testing on. Volta will be in Summit. What we expect to see is peak performance at least 10x over Titan, application performance 5 to 10x faster than Titan. Um, the uh, five of the CAR apps are relying on P are relying on OpenACC to be uh, ported to uh, Summit. The GTC code is one of those. Um, OpenACC is pretty much on a roll for adoption on production codes. And we've been adding support for Volta and doing our testing, and it looks really great. It's uh, And the same compiler, the same options used on x86 and on power, it's going to be a real bonus for those that are uh, using more than one system at a time. And so here I'm taking now that AWE code, and the first eight lines here you've already seen, the performance of this hydrodynamics code on uh, Haswell, Broadwell, Power8, Kepler, Pascal, Volta is now uh, 1.5x faster than Pascal. And this was, in fact, a pre-production x86 plus Volta system, so we expect the production version, and particularly when we're on power, to be even a little bit faster than that. So we're um, quite excited by the uh, performance potential of Volta. So I'll spend only a little bit of time here on the uh, OpenACC uptake here. So some of this is OpenACC marketing slides. This is what's happening. So a lot of top apps are now being ported to OpenACC. And I mentioned, I mentioned these already. I mentioned the car apps already. There's a lot of more applications being ported to OpenACC. And the reason is 
portability from GPUs to see parallel running on GPUs and on CPUs, and productive use of your time when you're doing your porting. There's uh, various levels of support. For those of you, if you have an application, you want to jumpstart your port to a GPU, uh, Oak Ridge has been driving these GPU hackathons. There are several of these every year. There were two in, in uh, Europe this year. There were several in the U.S. There is one more being run in Oak Ridge next month. There may be apparently one more. I'm sorry, that's a little bit dated. There was one more run, I think, uh, this past month in Boulder. And the idea is you send your team, so you send a team of two to three programmers or more with your application, your real application, on site. You commit to being on site for a week. What you're going to get is mentors, one or two or three mentors, well, one or two mentors assigned to your team to help you do your report. You can use OpenACC, you can use libraries, you can use CUDA, you can use OpenCL, you can use whatever method you want, but they're going to help you port your code to get GPU accelerated to at least give you a kickstart and a path to move forward on so you learn enough to where you can move forward. Um, uh, most of the ap application move, move, sorry, most of the applications have been using either OpenACC or CUDA. Um, there have been also a few mini hackathons where you, they're shorter, you don't get as much support. It's more of training for those that are really novices to parallel programming. And uh, it's been uh, all the application teams that go there uh, enjoy it. And several, of them, several of them have returned for additional help to either get uh, deeper into this application or to help port different parts of the application. There are other workshops and courses. Exceed at NSF has been running several workshops and courses uh, several times a year. There's online courses that are available. I have links to that on the last slide. There's a user group community. They have face-to-face -face meetings at uh, ISC and uh, Supercomputing and at GTC if you go to the NVIDIA Graphics Conference. A Slack channel, um, there's a lot of information available for those of you to help you port uh, your codes. So let me talk a little bit about some of the details about OpenACC and uh, where it's going in the near future. So we've been working on the OpenACC 2.6 version of the specification. And the, the most important feature that's going to be in OpenACC 2.6 is support for deep data structures. So modern codes, um, you know, arrays and vectors, matrices, those are so last millennium. Now modern codes have these large data structures where each element has pointers to other substructures that have other um, different sizes. So these are pointers inside this field that have uh, pointers to other vectors that may have themselves pointers to other vectors. So it's a deep data structure. And now I want to run this on this system over on the right, where I have a CPU in the system memory, a GPU and its device high bandwidth memory. And to run on the GPU, I want to move that data structure over to this high bandwidth memory, but not just the main array, some or all of these substructures as well, and have them work well over here. That's the deep copy problem. We've been calling for several years now this deep copy problem. I want to copy not just this array, but all the little subarrays. So this is actually a difficult problem technically for the implementation. It's a problem to figure out how to say this in a specification, how to spell this in a program in a way that makes sense and is productive for users. It's, uh, it's taken years to get to the point where we are, I'm sorry to say, but um, we haven't solved the problem yet. But where we are is, well, here's an example. So this is OpenACC 2.6, if we have manual deep copies, so this is going to be part of the spec. It's almost fully approved, this particular uh, ticket here. And the idea is you will have a data clause for the main structure, and that could be an array, and then data clauses for the subarrays that this structure points to. And what this subarray here will do is uh, copy the X vector to the device and then change the P.X pointer on the device to point to the X data that you just moved. So it's a two-phase thing. I need to allocate and move the data and I need to change the pointer to point to the data. 
this is a manual deep copy. So you can see it's a little bit um, painful because now I have to create the main structure and then create all the separate structures independently. And by that, by that I mean more lines of code, more directives. All that is overhead, but it works. It seems to work reasonably well. The direction we want to move in is to have a directives in the data type themselves that will give policies to say when I copy something of a points data type, also bring along the X and Y vectors, but not the Z vector, for instance. Um, we're not there yet, but this is the direction that we think we're probably going to move in. But let me go back to the uh, this deep copy. So this is from a real world example. So this is one of the applications that uh, we've been working with for some time, and they have this structure. In their case, it's a Fortran, so it's a derived types. Think of a derived type as the Fortran name of a C++ class, and it's four levels deep. You have a main array, and each member of those has pointers to other derived types, and each that are arrays, and each one of those has pointers to other derived types, and one of those has pointers to two more derived types. So to copy this whole structure over to the device, you need to copy the main array over here, and then go have a loop that will copy each one of those subarrays, then have a loop for that that copies these two arrays, and then have a loop for that that copies these two arrays. Now that's that's a lot of work. So rather than, for instance, just saying copy in the main array, they wrote a subroutine that will copy in the array and do all the manual deep copy of all this data. So that took, well, in this case, 107 lines of mostly directives to copy this data structure. Okay, this is a pretty complex data structure, but they had to copy this data structure just to copy it into the device. Oh, now you want to bring it back or you want to do an update. So 107 lines of code plus more for each one of these operations. So it's several hundreds of lines of code that they had to make this work. Well, we'd love to not have to do that. And when we get to the OpenACC 3.0 with the policy clauses, we think most of this will go away. But there's another option. You may be familiar with CUDA unified memory. So this is a CUDA term, CUDA unified memory. In a, the PGI side, we mostly call it managed memory. So physically, your system still looks like this. You have a multi-core CPU in the system memory. You have a highly parallel GPU and a smaller high bandwidth memory. The developer view is I have a single unified memory. Data is still going to move across the memory hierarchy in the same way that data moves through a cache hierarchy. You don't manage the cache hierarchy explicitly. You don't say move this data into the level three cache. Your program issues a memory load and the data moves through the cache hierarchy because the hardware will control the cache hierarchy. Well, we're treating the CPU, GPU memory just like a cache hierarchy. We're using hardware and software, that's the CUDA driver, uh, and um, uh, paging hardware on the device and the system to treat these two memories like a single unified memory and page data across the two memories. Now, the granularity is larger than a cache line. It would be a, a, a virtual memory page or a large page. But the concept is exactly the same. Now, when this first came up, um, let me do a, another cartoon here. So this is, how does this work on a P100? When this first came up on a Kepler, I was very skeptical. On a P100, uh, it's, it, it, it turned out pretty good on a Kepler. On a P100, it's even better because they have hardware support for paging. So in this case, when you allocate this memory on the device, if you're using this on a uh, on CUDA, for instance, you would use this call saying malloc managed memory, <clears throat> which is why we use the managed, we call this managed memory in, in um, at PGI. And when you set the values, well, it's going to create the data on the host. When I access these values on the device and get a page fault, then the data will page over to the device one page at a time. So it's demand paging. Um, so it's more or less a just too late data movement policy. But when locality works, data will page to where it's being used and will remain there for as long as possible. And we know mostly locality works because cache memories work and virtual memories work. 
And you might ask, how can this possibly perform very well? You've got data being paged dynamically. If the host go, transfers it, it's got to wait for it to be paged back. And I was also very skeptical, very skeptical about how this would work. So we ran this experiment. So PGI compilers have an option now to use this managed memory allocator for all dynamically allocated memory in your program. It basically changes all the malloc and calloc calls, all the C++ new calls, and the Fortran allocate and deallocate statements to use managed memory instead of system memory. And then that memory will get paged from the CPU to the GPU and back as necessary. What we're showing here is essentially the slowdown due to using managed memory as opposed to the explicit data directives that are in these are the 15 spec Excel benchmarks. And about half of these are Fortran and half of these are C or C++. And what we'll see is surprisingly most of, this, most of these, the slowdown is 10, maybe 20%. So here's a case where it's 20% here. And there's two lines here. The gray line is a power 8 plus NP100 on an NVLink. The green line is uh, Intel Haswell with a P100 and a PCI Express bus. And so what surprised me is that, you know, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't nearly as bad as I was afraid it would be. And in the future, as the support matures and we have operating system support for this uh, uh, for all the memory on the system, this should be even better. There's one outlier here, the SP benchmark. And we did a lot of analysis here to figure out what the problem was. It turns out in this case, there's an outer timing loop. In that outer timing loop was a call to a routine that has a local dynamically allocated array. And so every time through this loop, it's alloc it allocates this array and deallocates it. And the managed memory allocate and deallocate is really quite expensive. So there are ways that we're, we have worked on to address this problem, but it didn't show up in this run of this uh, benchmark. But we were able to, uh, in the best case, get this back up to where it's less than a 10% performance decrement. So, um, so we're back to, this is the, the, the four level derived type, dynamically allocated derived type that we had before. When we're using managed memory, I don't need any data directives. I can take them all out. And going from 107 times the number of operations down to zero is a very good thing. In fact, when I took this whole application, when I, don't, I say I, when the developers took this whole application with the manual deep copy, they had 1,200 directives. I love this sort of a slide, right? You got a big circle and a little circle. Only With unified memory, there are no data directives, essentially no data directives. So now all the directors are really talking about the parallelism, which is um, which is where it should be. So um, this is showing the uh, where the systems are going with powers. What we're showing on the right here. This is more or less what. Some of it is going to look like, except it will have three GPUs per power instead of two. Power nine, page migration engine, and additional, a lot of features, at, uh, coherence and atomics, coherent between the CPU and the GPU, higher speed, NVLink. This is going to be one powerful system. Now, I will be very clear that uh, with OpenACC programming, there are um, two open issues with respect to systems like this. One of them is, what's the best way to program multiple GPUs on a single application? And today, the best options we have are use OpenMP or MPI as your outer level parallelism and have each rank or each thread attached to a GPU. And then, so each thread or each rank is using a single GPU. And you might say that's cheating, but we've had, uh, uh, production applications use that quite successfully. At the Mateo Swiss site, for instance, they have their production system has eight NVIDIA K80s, and each K80 has two GPUs. So that's 16 GPUs per node. So they're doing a highly parallel per node computation. And that's the kind of, when they're using OpenACC, that's the kind of um, uh, uh, use of the multiple, that's how they, they run the multiple GPUs. And the second item, which is also quite important, is when well, I have these GPUs and those are really fast, that's great, but 
you know, this Power 9 processor here is also a very highly parallel, very performance engine. I want to use that as well. And how do I split my work across the Power 9 processor or my Intel Xeon processor as well as the GPUs that I have inside a single node? And there are very smart people struggling with that problem, and we don't have the solution ready yet. So um, if you have really great ideas, um, that would be wonderful. Most of the difficulty has to do with the data movement. Uh, if that page migration engine works and is really great, then that solution should be relatively easy. But I wanted to see the performance before I commit to that. Okay, a little bit late, Tesla GPU programming. This is the direction when we're doing our tutorials, this is what we state, how to learn or how to uh, port your program or learn to program with OpenACC. And the first thing is parallelize this for a multi-core CPU, just like I did in that uh, uh, iterative uh, solver, the iterative Jacobi solver I showed uh, at the beginning of the, of the presentation. I took the sequential code, inserted my directives, compiled this for a multi-core to get the parallelism working right and make sure it's executing right. And the second step is compile it for Tesla, but using managed memory. So managed memory says all the dynamically allocated memory will be using this managed attribute and will be migrated to and from the GPU device memory automatically by the NVIDIA CUDA GPU device driver. And that doesn't work today for stack or for static or global data. It's only for dynamically allocated data. So this may not work for all the data in your program. You still may need some data directives. But in many cases, all the data sets that we have are dynamically allocated. So this should work reasonably well. And for many people, they can stop there because they're getting performance that they're happy with. And if that's the case, that's fine. But if you want to do uh, uh, deeper analysis, get higher performance, do asynchronous operations on the GPU and the CPU, and overlap data transfers between the CPU and the GPU, then you will want to optimize and uh, insert explicit data directives. So that's step three. Then start thinking about where can I optimize my data movement and make sure that the data is, is being um, moved as infrequently and carefully as possible. And we found this to be reasonably successful for porting programs, sequential programs, into open ACC parallel execution. And then I have parallel on a multi-core and parallel on a, C, on a GPU. Uh, last couple of uh, tidbits here. So um, I'm putting my PGI hat back on for a little bit here, so the next couple of slides. This is a feature that will be coming with the PGI 17.9 release. This is coming up. And what we have now is much, much improved support for C++ lambdas. And what that means is when we have something like a templated execution policy driven um, class, say a for all class that's going to run loops in parallel, and I can choose to run it sequentially with OpenACC. And what I'm passing here is the, the lambda or the functor or what have you. And then down here, I don't need to add any, any directives for the, the uh, lambda or any directives here for what I need to do to execute this code. I can call this with the OpenACC policy. It will expand into uh, this loop here with the ACC parallel, and uh, Saxby is my lambda, it gets passed in, that works. Um, there's a little bit of compiler magic involved there, but what it, the intent is to uh, move towards a situation when we get to the uh, C++, whatever the next version is, it's going to have a parallel execution policies in their uh, standard template library um, uh, classes that the algorithms, sorry, it's enter template library algorithms that uh, will be able to use OpenACC as a backend for parallelizing those. And another C++ PGI performance slide. So this is now the, um, uh, let's see here, LCALs, it's a set of C++ loops. Um, 
think of this, uh, for those of you that have been around as long as I have, as the Livermore loops written in C++. And they have two versions of each loop. There's a loop written with for i equals, and there's a loop written with the for all abstraction, like what we had in the previous uh, slide. And early this year, there was a heavy abstraction penalty for using the for all. In the 17F7, you see there's essentially no abstraction penalty because we've resolved uh, the issues with that. Okay. And now, as a, a closing comments, I'm going to, um, this is really forward looking. So this is now that same loop that we saw before from the, um, the uh, AWE uh, uh, CFD application. The, I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm blanking about it. Full relief hydrodynamics application. The exact same loop, this is the code that they use. Now, the languages, Fortran and C++ are moving in a direction where they're going to actually have parallelism available in the language. What would this look like if I were to write this in a Fortran do concurrent? And that's the uh, Fortran 2015 do concurrent syntax. Well, the body of the loop would not change at all. What gets changed is instead of these do statements, I have a do concurrent uh, construct with multidimensional iterator, iterators as a local clause that basically corresponds to the loop private clause that we had in the previous slide, and then run this in parallel. Now, the plus side is these are really truly parallel loops. It doesn't really say anything about how to execute it. It just says, it says, run this in parallel. The downside is it has no support for reductions. This, I think, is a hole in the Fortran specification, but I'm not on that committee, so I don't get to express that to them. But there's no way to say I need, I want to do a reduction in the middle of my loop. You can collect the data you want to reduce to an array and then do a sum call or what have you outside the loop, but there's no way to do that inside here, which is, which is um, quite common today. So, um, uh, and also that has no support for atomics. Um, and nothing about a memory hierarchy or uh, moving data between levels of memory. But OpenACC can evolve to fill some of those gaps. Um, now, to be straightforward, the PGI compilers do not yet support this syntax. We don't support 20, 20, Fortran 2015. But the direction that we would like to go is to leverage the syntax that's in the language as much as possible. So when you say do concurrent and you're compiling for a GPU target, we can compile this for parallel execution on the GPU the same way we can compile an open ACC kernels or parallel loop for parallel execution on a GPU. And then similarly for C++, you're going to have those C++ uh, parallel execution policies and their algorithms and the so on, and we should be able to do it the very similar, essentially exact same thing when we get to uh, uh, doing this with, with C++. All right, so I'm uh, closing down now. This is my final slide saying uh, some of the other resources that are available. If you have the PDF file, these are links to the web, openacc.org uh, is the website uh, for this first one. The second one is at... Uh, uh, it's a YouTube channel, the OpenACC YouTube channel. You'll find entertaining and hopefully educational five to ten minute videos about uh, your how to learn to program OpenACC. You can get the PGI Community Edition. There's a Twitter feed if you want to follow PGI compilers and um, other OpenACC events. So if anybody wants to uh, uh, unmute or um, I will check the um, the uh, uh, for other questions. Um, and I don't have, and I do have a lawnmower behind me, so I have to speak up.
So, um, We'll, uh, we'll keep the uh, chat open till the top of the hour. And uh, if you have any other questions, if you want to